Okay, I think we are we are now live. So very good. Uh, get all this technology sorted out. So welcome everyone uh, once again uh, to another virtual meeting. We're hoping that there may not be too many more of these because uh, we'd all love to uh, be doing these in council chamber uh, like we're accustomed to. Um, we um, may be having some uh, special presentations uh, in the meeting as uh, people arise, uh, arrive, so we'll, we'll deal with that uh, accordingly. So uh, welcome everyone, and so uh, first item of business, Madam Clerk. Roll call, Your Worship. I have taken the roll, and all members of council are present. Thank you. Next item, please. A motion to adopt this evening's agenda. Take a motion for that. Councillor Parker, seconded by... Let's see another hand here. The screen's flat. Councillor Cullum. Any changes or additions? Not seeing any. We're going to call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Next item, please. Confirmation of the minutes of the regular meeting of council held June 7th. And for council's information, uh, just um, you, you will notice on the um, that we do have a recognition of National Indigenous Peoples Day. We're just uh, waiting uh, potentially for our guest, and so when he arrives, we'll come back to that. So we're we're not just skipping over it. So back to the minutes. I did see some hands up. Councilor Shaboye, seconded by Councilor Cameron. Any uh, errors or omissions in the previous minutes? Not seeing any, we'll call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. I will, uh, though this is National Indigenous Peoples Day, and we um, we hope to have a uh, uh, kind of an invocation about that. But um, in light of that, I, I would like to, uh, at least at this point, uh, the beginning of the meeting, acknowledge that the city of Brandon shares the land located on Treaty 2 territory which is the traditional homelands of the Dakota, Anishinaabek, Oji Cree, Cree, Dene, and Métis peoples. And we uh, respect the treaties that were made in our region. So again, we don't uh, do a land acknowledgement at uh, every single meeting, but on special occasions like this, it would certainly be uh, fitting to do that and remind uh, everyone of our uh, respect for the treaties and the uh, land acknowledgement of uh, the people that... Uh, came before us and are now we are now sharing the land with. So uh, we can move on to the next item, please. Under the order of presentations, Your Worship, we have Lindsay Hargraves, the environmental coordinator, to give us an update on the residential rain garden pilot program. And welcome, Ms. Hargraves. Evening, Your Worship and Councillors. Once this gets going, I'll be talking about uh, the Residential Rain Garden Pilot Program. So just quick background, uh, during Council deliberations in January, Council allocated money for surface drainage education and rain gardens. So what is stormwater? Stormwater is the water from rain or melted snow that is not absorbed in the ground. In urban areas, stormwater goes into storm sewers and empties into the bodies of water, such as the Sittawood River. Stormwater may look clean, but it picks up pollution along the way back to the river, such as gasoline, motor oil, pet waste, pesticides, and any other contaminants it collects along the street. So how to be stormwater friendly? You can purchase or make your own rain barrel to collect rain water off of your roof to water your lawn and plants. You can pick up after your pet. Don't dump anything down a storm drain, such as automotive products, paints, and grease. Or you can build a rain garden on your property. So for those that don't know, this is kind of just a snapshot of what a rain garden is. The water from your roof goes down the downspout and slopes into a shallow depression garden where there are plants that are rooted and are drought tolerant. And it can also sit in water for two days while that filters downwards 
or its groundwater instead of rushing off onto the street. There's a couple of photos of rain gardens. Uh, we have a few on city property. Uh, the park plaza outside the youth center uh, and two at the airport. So the benefits of rain gardens, they reduce the amount of water that enters the local storm sewer network. They reduce flooding, mitigate drainage issues and prevent stream banks from eroding. They restore and recharge groundwater system, replicating the natural hydrological cycle. They attract birds, butterflies and pollinators and other beneficial insects such as mosquito consuming dragonflies. Um, they also reduce the amount of pollutants that run from urban areas straight into our waterways and they are not a mosquito habitat. So the residential rain garden pilot program, we're seeking up to 10 viable residential properties and one on city property for demonstration and showcase sites. Uh, so this first year is just a pilot, just to show what a rain garden is in different areas of the city. We've partnered with Central Cinnaboyne Watershed District. The city is a member and they have expertise in implementing rain gardens. We're also the largest urban member in a watershed district. And so this program fits along the lines of their mandate. So how does the process work? Interested homeowners fill out a basic eligibility form online at brandon.ca. You must be a resident of Brandon and the rain garden must be installed on a property you own within the city of Brandon. The rain garden must be in a low-lying location. It must be installed at least three meters away from the foundation of your house. You must be able to redirect a downspout from your roof to the rain garden area. And the proposed rain garden location must be clear of any trees or underground services. So eligible participants are assessed on a first come first serve basis if the property meets all criteria. I want to stress that they're assessed. That doesn't mean they're just because you fill out an application, you automatically get one. So in addition to the basic criteria, the rain garden has to be free of interfering with utilities, not intruding on right away or any city easements or infrastructure. The yard size and roof runoff ratio has to be enough for functionality and proposed site has to pass an infiltration test. And that infiltration test is just to see how fast the water can drain back down into the ground. So this is a partnership. Again, city promotes the program and pre-screens applicants. The Central Cinnaboy Watershed District works with the homeowner and assists with pre-screening and overseas <laughs> installation of the rain gardens and also li liaison between the city and the homeowner. The goals of the program is to create awareness of rain gardens. Success as pilot will be a stepping stone to a long-term program. Uh, there are some cities that have subsidy programs once they're established. And then more information about rain gardens and stormwater education can be found at brandonenvironment.ca. Uh, currently, there are, we've launched this program last Monday. We had 20 applicants. By, um, we have 20 applicants by Wednesday. We did a first preliminary assessment and that 20 applicants went down to 12. So we've taken in a couple more just so we'll, because each time you go through the property, you do the first assessment just to scout it out. And then once you do the infiltration test, not every property is going to pass that. And then there, once you find out where the utilities, then it's going to be, it's going to get whittled down. So. Right now, we have about 24 properties that we're screening through. But with that, I will pass it over to Council if you have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hargraves. So very interesting um, uh, concept. Uh, I've seen some in the city uh, myself, so it could be uh, quite exciting. So I'm going to start with Councilor Shaboye. Uh, thank you, Worship, through to Ms. Hargraves. Uh, thanks for this um, concept of having a rain garden. I, I think it's a great idea, and it's also a great idea for a bee city friendly, depending on what plants are put in the garden. Uh, that leads to my question about the garden aspect of it. Uh, one thing I noticed on the criteria, you didn't say anything about maintenance. Um, is that part of the criteria list? Because, you know, it's one thing to have this installed on your property, but um, as 
you know, I take a serious interest in gardening. I think that uh, maintenance is the biggest part about having a garden. Uh, is that part of the program as well? So once the garden is installed, then the homeowner takes 100% ownership of it. Um, so if you get plant native plants, which are preferred, they're going to take a while to establish. But then once they're established, the rain garden is very low maintenance. So you'll just have to do some minor weeding and that is about it. Okay, thanks. Are you providing them with some basic information on rain, rain gardens or websites they could visit uh, to see what plants are appropriate for a rain garden? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Shaboy, we do have a list on the city's website and on um, brandonenvironment.ca, and it was a list that was a capstone project that ACC Land and Water Management students created. Uh, thank you, uh, Lindsay, for the presentation, and I think it would be a good partnership if, if everyone uh, does their part in establishing it and maintaining it. Thank you very much. So we have Councillor Fawcett next. Right on. Uh, thank you through your worship uh, to Ms. Hargraves. And yeah, this is a great project. Uh, I'm glad to see you've already got uh, a good number of uh, applicants. And, and I may have missed it, but did can... Uh, uh, like you, it was for residential, but can businesses or any uh, other properties apply as well? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Fawcett, for this year, it's just residential. Okay, I just wanted to have clarity on that. And I recall us putting the first one in the city on a home on uh, Patricia Avenue, uh, and it was nice to see. And uh, if you go by uh, Councillor Cullen's place, you can take a look at one as well. So it's great, good projects. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Fawcett. I didn't see any other hands up. Um, it wasn't clear, I, I might just for clarity, are there any financial implications um, on our part on, on this one? I didn't, uh, if there were, I didn't, uh, I might have missed it, but uh, or is it the uh, 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 watershed district that is handling that end of it? Um, Your Worship, we have a one-time financial contribution this year of $25,000 that's being managed by the conservation or, or watershed district. Um, okay. Because we are the largest urban center, some of the projects that get funded in a normal watershed district, like drainage ditches, culverts, it's not really applicable to the cities. So, now, um, the watershed district is looking at external funding for next year, and this will be leveraged for that so that we could access external funding for to expand this program. That was good. That's all I needed to know. Thank you. Okay, not seeing any other questions. Thank you again, Lindsay. Uh, excellent uh, program, and uh, love to see it uh, moving forward. No doubt you'll have enough interest to uh, fill this out uh, quite easily. So a motion to receive uh, would be in order, please. Councillor Shaboy, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the presentation by Lindsay, Lindsay Hargraves, Environmental Coordinator, with respect to an update on the Residential Rain Garden Pilot pro Program be received. Thank you. Seconder, please. Councillor Cullen, any discussion? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I would just like to say that I think this is a great step in in trying to retain water. You know that the citizens have mentioned to us repeatedly about what's going to happen with all the storm water and some of the tools that we can use to uh, retain water instead of letting it flow into uh, gutters and into people's yards. That uh, rain gardens is just one more tool that can help us with this with with the problem with uh, overland flooding too. And I hope to see more of it happen, too, on some of uh, city property if we have an opportunity for, for areas, too, to have more rain gardens and drainage ponds. Well said. Any other comments before we call the question? Seeing none, I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And next item, uh, Madam Clerk, I see our guest arrive, so yes. it might be a good time to uh, do that. Yes, Your Worship, I would uh, like to introduce Elder Frank Tachan, Tachin, I apologize, uh, who would like to uh, start the National 
Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you very much. So welcome, Elder uh, Tashin, and uh, we're uh, grateful that you could join us. Uh, it's perfect. Our council meeting happens to fall on National Indigenous Peoples Day, and uh, you had a willingness to uh, join us and, and uh, kind of help us with a, a wee bit of a virtual ceremony, at least, to uh, uh, honor that. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, evening, sorry. Uh, before I begin my, my prayer, it's just that uh, it's nice to see, you know, the people that represent the city, you know, I appreciate what you guys do for us. And, uh, you know, keep the, just, you know, we need to work together. I always address that time after time. And slowly that's coming together. And, and you know, with this uh, <clears throat> situation that we bumped into from the Kelloops, BC, with 215 children that were found on my graves, you know, that really, really impacted uh, me and my wife. We're last week, a couple of weeks ago, and we were so emotional. And to go up to the old Indian Red School site here in Brandon, you know, it, again, it brought a lot of memories of my experience in that system. But you know what? We just got to move forward and accept what's what's happened. But then again, you know, I always talk about unity. Let's let's put one heart, one mind together. And not just look at the skin color. You know, I always say we're all human beings in this world. We're all human beings. We shouldn't forget that. We all have different culture, different language, whatever. You know, we just got to <clears throat> respect each other. That's the most important part within or on this world is respect. And... <clears throat> For myself, within the city of Brown, this is this is my home now. Bought a house. This is my home now. When I look out into the city, slowly things are changing for the for the better of our First Nations, Métis, Inuit people. And you, the leaders, I thank you for that. And sometimes, in this materialistic world that we live today, we forget to. Think about life. Life isn't within us, especially when we live in a materialistic world. And sometimes we really have to look at ourselves, our husbands, our wives, or our children, and to understand and understand that life. What is life? Life isn't about having a whole bunch of money or big house or whatever. Life is living together as human beings and to appreciate everything that's above us, around us, below us. And sometimes we don't go there. Because again, this materialistic world teaches about shame. It teaches about jealousy. It teaches about hate. All these negative things within the city. And also this racism. You know, I pray every day it'll go away. But maybe not in my time. Maybe it will go away. And to sit in here in front of you, talking to you, I hope you're listening. Because sometimes, you know, the words that come out of our mouth is so hurtful. And we forget to go where the compassion is. You know, as human beings, again, I, we're supposed to be compassionate people. But today, we're so struggling with the negative things of this world. And, you know, the homeless population, you know, we shouldn't have that. But it exists today. So with that, you know, I appreciate what your male and female are doing for our city. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I will assist you or any questions you have or Come and sit with me, you know, I'm open to that. So people, look within your heart. Don't use this. This this will mess you up. I've been there and done that. So
So as First Nations people, you know, when we do ceremonies, we pray for the community. We pray for our leaders especially and our MLAs and, and so forth to make this a better place to live. And sometimes greed gets in our way. So today with that, I'm going to do a little prayer and that you have a wonderful, wonderful meeting. Whatever comes out of your mouth, mean it. Because our future grandchildren are going to suffer in this world if we don't change this world for the better. And the reason why I say that because the racism still goes on in within the city here. I like to just you know wipe that out so our little children can play together. They don't judge each other. They they play together. Why can't we do the same? So we gotta learn from our our, our grandchildren, our children. So with that, I should shut up now. You guys are getting bored. Yes, <laughs> kidding. And laughter is good. You have to laugh. If you get too serious, what happens? You start making mistakes, and mistakes, you know, there's consequences. So be careful. Put a little uh, fun humility in your in your meetings. You what you go along ways. You get that heaviness off your chest. So with that, again, uh, I'll do a little prayer in my own language. How I can't talk about back to the good guy hitter. How did me do? Oh, mach be a domain you mach be. Oh, how did we could get here get chan? How did it touch a parok he chung a piti na? He which you hopped. Oh, how did I go ashti you over the cup there? To go to get na? You are the who are kind to get na? Oh, you are ashti there. Talk over the talk over the sampa get na? And han we go ashka go ashka touch a piti na? Da ko te na ashti. Welcome to Nahum, the Hatch and Yoke for Yuskia. A Kepa Wita, what Oaks and News will cheap me. Our Kataka did not own Chakia. Are we a kid with Kushka Kitina? Oi Chako. Okadahan, dark what there was at the Hena. Walk about Hedy Botokina Shapi. Okadahan Tashaki Dina, Tawachaki with Chashako. That's a devil was in the cobbles to watch the Yoke for Yuski money to that. Okadet, we look at the dead. Makocha cut mu copy hun, Oyat and is Ochakio. Dago and the wash take the desert awacha. Dago is she chicks. Our country coshu kidapo. Ho hetch and ushu hochichira. Nan ushu kida. How she kida. Creator God, give us your blessing today. Creator, as I said before you in a humble way. Creator, look at our leaders. Bless them. Straighten their minds and their hearts. To make the right choices for the people, not just one, one nation, but all nation. Give them that compassion, that respect for each other and for outside, the people. So God, Creator, bless them. Give them that strength because we're at the epidemic where this COVID-19, this virus is going around. Straighten their bodies so that you don't catch the disease. Because we need our leaders within the city of Brandon. Also take care of their children. Their children are so precious within this this world that we live in today. You keep their children safe from this COVID-19 that's going around. And their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Their nieces, their nephews, all their kinship. So creator God, that they have a beautiful meeting to talk about what's what's good in this world for our people. So also bless the city of Brandon. Take the negative stuff out, replace it with positive things. So in the future, we can work together. So Creator God, this is our preacher today. How she get up, how she get up. Amen, thank you. Thank you very much, Elder Tashin. That was a very fitting uh, Today, I know that we would normally have um, lots of fabulous uh, festivities in, in the city of Brandon for uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day. And under the uh, COVID restrictions, uh, we're not able to do quite that today. But certainly the, uh, the, uh, the organizing group did carry on in a virtual fashion. Yeah. I did have occasion to attend uh, uh 
two ceremonies, one today and one last Thursday out at the residential school site to uh, honor the children, you know, what you have mentioned. And uh, mm -hmm. so thank you very much. And I would thank uh, Councillor Dejarle for, um, you know, having the inspiration to provide that for us today. And mm -hmm. I would, uh, before we uh, say goodnight to you, uh, Frank, I would maybe ask either Councillor Dejarle or Councillor uh, Fawcett, who both uh, our representatives of the Brandon Urban Aboriginal People's Council, if they had anything that they wanted to add on uh, National uh, Indigenous Peoples Day uh, to help round it out before we carry on with the rest of the meeting. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Desjarlais. Yeah. I want to thank you for the land involvement this evening, and I want to thank uh, Elder Tatchin for uh, spending his time with us and his um, his guidance and leadership in our community. And uh, I want to thank the Friendship Center uh, for the work that they they did uh, in their committee, their National Indigenous Peoples Day Committee, to to host a, a virtual event today, um, irrespective of the challenges that we're, we're facing uh, through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So thank you to the Friendship Center. Thank you to all our um, all the members of Blue Pack. And um, I think everybody can just be reminded of what today is. It's it's National Indigenous Peoples Day, but it's a summer solstice. Mm -hmm. And what that means to all of us. Uh, it's the longest day of the year. And um, for me, it means that it's going to be a tough time getting my kids to go to bed tonight. <laughs> oh, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Alder Tatch. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, if you had anything to add, Councillor uh, Fawcett, uh, Councillor DeJarley did a nice job there. But Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor DeJarley did do a nice job. I, I always like the opportunity to listen to uh, Frank. So uh, anytime I can, I, I enjoy it. And uh, thank you, Frank, for being such a leader in the community. And uh, it's been a pleasure to watch the last 10 years or so of Urban Aboriginal People's Council with you as we've all tried to work together to do improvements for the people in the city. And we'll keep doing that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, as uh, Frank knows, in normal times, uh, Frank, Frank, rarely a week would go by that we were not in each other's company, and I got to uh, uh, share in the uh, words of wisdom that you always provided, and I don't mind telling you, it, was, it drew great uh, strength and in inspiration for that, and I've been missing that, so thank you for coming uh, to our meeting, and uh, a great and fitting way to... Uh, help mark National Indigenous Peoples Day, and uh, we're grateful that you were able to do that. And while it's the longest night of the year, yeah. <laughs> we, we hope it's not the longest meeting of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Frank. Hey, good night. Yeah, Very good. So that was a very fitting thing, and I'll turn it back to you, uh, Madam Clerk, for the next item on the agenda, please. Next item is committee reports, Your Worship, and I believe we have a report from the Brandon Police Board. Very good. I think uh, Councillor Barry uh, was prepared for that. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you to Council, on uh, behalf of uh, Brandon Police Board Board of Directors, I am going to just uh, read out some notes from Police Chief uh, Wayne Balkin of our meeting we had on June 11th. Um, uh, Police Chief Balkan's report wanted to let us know that uh, noted the staff of the BPS are in process of taking to finalizing the cultural awareness and humility training offered by the Canadian Police Knowledge Network. At this time of the meeting, 56% or 76 of the staff have finished the training and the remainder of staff are expected to complete the training by the end of the summer. Uh, my apologies uh, also on this committee, of course, is His Worship Mayor Crest and uh, Councillor Barry Cullen and our City Manager Ron Bowles also sit on the Police Board. Uh, other items that were brought up by Chief Balkan uh, dealing with the Police Budget, uh, he reported that the first quarter budget review was projecting an unfavorable operating budget variance of approximately $42,000. It's based on many factors, mostly including staffing costs as well as reduced revenues from fines and criminal record checks, uh, mainly driven by COVID. Uh, the chief reported a favorable variance on the capital budget of approximately $41,000 due to saving, savings on the installation of the police fleet equipment. And to date, the police service has met approximately 
of its vacancy management commitment, which was set at $337,500 for 2021. Uh, some statistics that the police, uh, the chief of police shared with us. In the first quarter of 2021, BPS has removed 638 grams of methamphetamine off the streets of Brandon. They have also received 11,873 calls for service in the first quarter of the year, which includes 252 bylaw calls and 485 animal control calls. The average calls per sworn officer for the first quarter is 129. The BPS calls for service are 8% higher this year than our 10 year average. So even with COVID, our calls for service per officer are even higher this year than what they have been. One of the questions that was raised at our board meeting was about uh, enforcement with COVID rules. And the, the chief of police did report that uh, reported between April 1st of 2020 and March, 30, March 31st of 2021, um, 76 BPS staff have had to self-isolate or be in the workplace due to COVID illness and or health restored eviction, uh, restrictions. Uh, BPS has worked with the city ITC and HR departments to allow individuals to work from home where needed. In the same period, BPS has attended to 1,269 calls for service for COVID-19 related incidents, including 821 residential checks to ensure compliance with federal quarantine orders, 221 calls from the provincial tip line and 448 calls for service that were self-initiated. BPS has issued 28 tickets under the acts uh, and works with various provincial entities within the city to enforce the orders, conduct, inspections and provide ongoing education. It's been a question in the community about what enforcement BPS is doing and I thank the chief for bringing those stats forward to let people know what exactly our members have been up to. Uh, in dealing with the downtown strategy, this year's strategy focuses will be on foot, bicycle and police cruiser patrol cars. The lead is being taken by the police services community policing unit and supplemented by all areas of the police service. Uh, May 30th or May 3rd to May 30th, the police service had 3,171 calls for service. And out of those 3,171 calls, 1,089 of them were from the downtown area. So pretty much just over a third of the calls for service were coming from the downtown area. Uh, Project Brazen, which everybody I'm sure is well aware of, after a 16 month investigation, the BC BPS conducted search warrants on seven residents of Brandon and seized approximately four kilograms of cocaine and $120,000 in currency and other offense related property. 10 individuals were arrested and a warrant of arrest was issued for an 11th person. Uh, again, thanks to BPS for the good work and with their counterparts at the RCMP at the province level and the Winnipeg Police Force uh, taking that much uh, narcotics off the street in, a, in a, a time where we are dealing with a meth problem uh, is, is very thankful on behalf of, I know myself, um, members of council and many citizens of Brandon. And that is my report, unless uh, Councillor Collin or yourself, your worship, have anything to add to it. On uh, my part, that was an excellent report. And uh, just for council's information, uh, as well as general public, uh, for whatever reason, we had not sort of routinely reported, made committee reports from the police board uh, uh, occasions, uh, such as some of our other uh, city committees do. And so uh, through Councillor Barry's initiative, we're going to rectify that and, and make this a regular occurrence. Helps to keep council um, informed and the general public at the same time. And uh, certainly that was a very uh, uh, fulsome report. But we will open it up for any questions anyone may have of uh, Councillor Barry or any member of the police board. Councillor Shaboya, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through to Councillor Barry. Um, has, has your police board um, discussed uh, mental health intervention? Because uh, I know that I, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading across the country on when crises happen. A lot of times, um, you know, it's, it's not really a policing issue. It's more of a, a mental health, um, you know, should be an intervention uh, for those kind of crises. And in most, uh, most larger urban centers, they use mobile crisis units to deal with that. Has your board had discussions on, on that? Uh, thank you. Through you, Your Worship, to Council Shaboye. I'll be brief on this because, again, I'm not in the, uh, as part of the police board, we're not really in the operations part. I do know they have, offer services uh, for counseling and other options of that, but um, probably more learned on this issue would be his, uh, his worship himself, Mayor Crest, could maybe comment on that uh, question. 
Yeah, it is. thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Shiboye, Councillor Barry. And it, certainly it is a broadening area, as uh, Council is well aware. Um, we do have the uh, uh, community mobilization, the hub table, that is certainly is a collection of many um, local agencies. It was established by the Brandon Police Service. Uh, they meet, I think, still uh, twice a week, uh, uh, identifying uh, individuals of, um, that uh, may be experiencing an elevated risk either to themselves or to others and you know those referrals are made at that hub table and um you know the police do assist uh, and you know they do sort of assign the appropriate uh, services and try and connect people to services to try and you know take it out of a uh, criminal element so that would be certainly one area that's been a you know highly effective and successful area certainly not covering everything and uh you know, mental health issues are certainly, um, you know, a significant part of of day-to-day uh, uh, -day operation. The uh, police also did uh, implement a, um, kind of a, well, it's called, uh, I believe it's called Health IM. It's an online service that connects the uh, on-the-street police officers to um, health and, and particularly mental health information sort of directly on the spot. And uh, that has been quite useful and effective. I think that's been in effect for a, a year or two. And, uh, you know, I think they're finding that quite handy. So those are things that come to mind. We could, you know, certainly ask Chief Balkan for a broadening of uh, the issues. But uh, you're very correct, Councillor Shaboy, that uh, mental health uh, situations are uh, a very large part of the Brown and Police Services work. Uh, and a growing part, unfortunately, uh, oftentimes it's because they're the only ones that are open at certain uh, um, hours of the day and, and night, and they're the ones asked to intervene. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks for that. I just think that we have to continue the discussion on, especially on dealing with emergency situations and, and where meetings and um, people can come together, that uh, there's a way to respond uh, immediately for people that are having uh, mental health issues and uh, and we have the right tools to, to provide that. So so thanks for that. I guess we're moving forward a bit. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the uh, the challenges are bigger, but so are the resources and the level of training uh, that they have access to. So thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. Any other maybe, uh, just also if I can intervene for a second, maybe we should um, also ask them to expand the discussion with Prairie Mountain Health to maybe look at um, providing those types of services. It might be a useful discussion. Thank you. Through the police board, we can uh, certainly raise that at a, at a future meeting. So thank you very much. Thanks. Any other uh, questions of the police board report to uh, Councillor Cameron? Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, you to uh, either Councillor Barry or another member of the police board. Um, now that we are a, a, a number of months into the direct, direct uh, lockup process, um, just wondering if the police board has been informed uh, as to the the effectiveness of of moving to that route as opposed to the uh, the provincial uh, route in the city of Brandon. Just wondering if. Uh, if that's an update that the police board receives or if that's something more that we should direct to the to the chief. Thank you. Uh, through, through you, your worship to Council Cameron, I think that's a good question, Sean. We did have a brief uh, report in last meeting, but really um, that kind of information, I'm sorry, I just don't have that to share with you. That would be a, a good question to put directly to the chief of police and get a response back for him that maybe he can counsel all or copy all of council on. I Thank you very much, through your worship. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I think it would be good information for for council to have. Obviously, as the delivery model has changed within the city, so it'd be good for us to 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 have that information. Thank you. And Councillor Cullen, you had something to add? Or? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, your worship, through you to uh, Councillor Cameron. Uh, I did. Uh, uh, asked that same question to the chief of police during the last board meeting or uh, in regards to whether or not our temporary uh, lockup facilities were working well and uh, if they were uh, handling our needs and he had said that they were uh, that they were performing uh, to uh, 
the, the specifications and, and uh, uh, that were required for us right now. And they were, but they were uh, again in the process of uh, um, setting it up for a permanent uh, facility versus being a temporary facility. But at this time, uh, what we have uh, going right now is uh, has been working well. Thank you for adding that. Go ahead, Councillor Cameron. Thank you. Uh, through your worship, I was just going to follow up and just uh, thank Councillor Cullen for that as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, to both of you. And, and again, it's, you know, I, it, it's kind of a, we're kind of growing into this. You know, it was um, sort of precipitated originally by COVID and then it was made permanent uh, by the province. Uh, you know, it really, um, we were apparently the only province in the, in the country, really two municipal police forces that had a direct uh, lockup. And so that was the impetus for that uh, theory kind of legally is that, um, you know, a person ought not to be housed in a provincial jail until they've had uh, some due process, like having been before a judge or a magistrate. And and that was kind of the reason behind it was a bit of a legal, almost human rights consideration. So that's been resolved. And so we're having to learn to deal with the new reality and just move forward. So that's, uh, I give our police service a great deal of credit. They had to really uh, kind of jump to the pump, so to speak, and figure this out, uh, you know, in the middle of COVID, I might add. And, you know, they did a fabulous job, and now we're making it more permanent. So any other questions uh, any counselor may have? I'm not seeing any, so uh, thank you for that report, Councillor uh, Barry. Uh, before we take a motion to accept it, sometime there are other committee reports that uh, we were not aware of, so we could uh, take those now if there are any. Okay, appears there aren't any others, so uh, a motion to receive the police board report would be in order, please. Moved by Councillor Barry. Seconded by Councillor Cullen. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. The order of inquiries, Your Worship. Inquiries. We've got Councillor DeJarley. And a visitor. Sorry, uh, through your worship, uh, I'm wondering if we could get an update on the uh, downtown task force that was announced during our um, state of the uh, city address. I think um, residents and business owners would love to hear if uh, we're planning what we're planning for the summer and how we're making out with progress. Very good. So uh, a response has been put forward that uh, as we routinely do, we'll have our city manager, Ron Bowles, uh, Provide to council. Mayor Crest, uh, I find this uh, this topic by uh, Councillor Desjardins Desjardins um, very timely, um, given uh, it's related to uh, the, the committee report you just received on the Brandon, Brandon Police Board. Um, I, I also found a, a good link to uh, Elder Tashin's conversation today. He talked about good decision making, and he talked about uh, homelessness. So uh, this ties in well. This response to Councillor Desjardins' uh, question is provided by Mayor Rick Crest and by myself, Ron Bull, City Manager. Like many downtowns and many communities, Brandon has been seeing an uptick in difficulties that are all too common with the economic side of downtowns and, more recently, the social difficulties brought on by poverty, homelessness, mental health and addiction struggles. Council will be aware that during the State of the City Address a few weeks ago, the Mayor indicated in intentions of creating a Downtown Wellness and Safety Task Force as a means of creating a better sense of safety in our downtown, as well as examining the social needs of residents assessing services there. 
Our administration, led by City Manager, has begun to create a framework and mandate for this task force, borrowing from other initiatives found in other communities seeing similar challenges. It is expected that this that this outline will be presented informally to Council in the next few weeks and shared with the community shortly thereafter. It is anticipated that this process will concern itself with both near-term actions to enhance safety and cleanliness and longer-term strategies that will coordinate a more holistic approach to challenges in the downtown. It is believed that many of these circumstances uh, will have a broader impact on the community as a whole as we are aware that there are challenges in many neighbourhoods in Brandon. In the meantime, the good work of the Brandon Downtown Development Corporation continues on the economic side. More immediate safety considerations have ramped up through the Brandon Police Services Downtown Strategy uh, through enhanced patrols. The city has augmented this or the city has as well augmented this through contracted security patrols. Council and the community can expect to see more details of this downtown of our downtown initiatives in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, um, City Manager. That was a great uh, update, and I know that uh, the residents and business owners uh, from the downtown um, that have been reaching out to me are pleased to hear that we're moving forward um, this summer and that they will be hearing from us soon. So that's very much appreciated. Thank you. Good. Thanks for uh, bringing that up, Councillor DeJarly. And now we have Councillor Barry. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to administration, uh, my inquiry tonight is, uh, again, what I've made previously, and this is, uh, I think, probably at least the third year in a row I've asked about this, and it's about the repair work uh, that needs to be done on Brookwood Drive. I've, I've had calls, again, from people, and um, over the last few years, we've been told, you know, things were going to get done. It was going to get repaired either by the developer or by the city, and to date, uh, the only thing that's been done is some new curbing put in, but nothing with the asphalt uh, surface part, which is really the problem. Um, just to give everybody an idea of what's going on there, we're, we're facing the same problem on Brookwood Drive that was basically we had on Durham Drive, and that was all the uh, heaving and everything else, and it's causing a, uh, an issue there with uh, people using that road. So um, with that, uh, I want to I would like to inquire um, what uh, what is going to be done, how soon is it going to be done, because we seem to be pushing this late into construction season all the time and then coming up with the reason, well, it's too late, we can't do anything now. And it's been three years in a row, and people's patience is done out there. I'm getting calls again. Um, I would like to see something set up that we get this dealt with by the end of July at the latest, and something I can get back to the residents and assure them it's going to be done, and, and no more empty promises of it's going to get looked after this year. And here we go again, it doesn't get done, because it's just been too many years in a row. Okay, thank you for that. Again, um, City Manager Ron Bulls has a uh, response for us. And through, uh, through Mayor Crest again, uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Barry. I believe I have some good news, and this is probably the first of a, of a couple um, updates on this uh, on this initiative. So this response was provided by Mark Ellert, uh, so he's your Director of Engineering Services. And he goes on to say, Administration staff will be meeting with the developer and their engineering consultant this week to discuss a schedule and approach to resurfacing these sections of roadway. The city envisions milling the surface approximately two inches uh, to restore uh, the level profile and then to replace it with a new two inches of asphalt lift. It is our understanding this work will be undertaken by Zenith Paving. Uh, thank you, uh, City Manager Ron. Uh, just a quick follow-up, uh, if I would, if I could, Your Worship, on this. Sure. Um, just quickly, I, I, just to let uh, the folks know that maybe are watching the council meeting tonight and, and maybe fall into the area of Brookwood that see this all the time. I did have a lengthy telephone conversation with uh, Mark Allard, who is the Director of, of Engineering Services here at the city today, about this subject. I do appreciate the response Mark gave, and Ron, I do appreciate your response to this. But again, there's no timeline, and that's been the problem with this whole project. Is, is the promise to get it done has always been there, but it's not getting done. And, and we need to, I'm glad to hear they're having a meeting Friday. I did talk to Mark about this. I, I certainly expressed the opinion of myself and the residents of, of when we'd like to see this get done and, and not leave it 
hanging anymore for the end of the year. Otherwise, I'd like to see the city just go and do it and, and look after whatever we have to do with the developer later because, again, um, we're just tired of hearing the reasons why it's not getting done, and we'd like to see it get done. Thanks, Councillor Barry. We'll, we'll maybe uh, ask the city manager to flag this one for a follow-up. Often, you know, the, we get the responses back at the council meeting, and there, you know, we don't know, necessarily get the follow-up. So I think that uh, he'll uh, follow this one for us, and we'll realize the uh, level of urgency given the construction season that's short around here, and uh, we can ask him to uh, follow that up for us. Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that very much, Your Worship. Thank you. I'm uh, pretty sure you got that information, Mr. Bull, and we can uh, do our best on that. Okay, um, those are the only inquiries we were made aware of in advance, but sometimes things arise uh, uh, later in the day. If there were any, we could take those now. I'm not seeing any. So thank you very much. We can uh, move on to the next item, please. The order of announcements, Your Worship. Announcements. I'll open the floor. I do. I will have one myself, but uh, I'll open the floor up to ones that council may have. Not seeing any uh, others jump out, so I will jump in while the rest of you may be. Uh, thinking. Uh, you can probably see behind me uh, a very nice wall hanging that was um, uh, presented to me out in front of City Hall by, uh, you know, our organization, B-City Brandon. So it was provided by the uh, chair of B-City, Sherry uh, Punak Murphy. They call her the Queen Bee because she's the chair of that uh, board, very uh, fitting. And the uh, the wall hanging was made by uh, Sylvia Barr, a local resident uh, who I believe was also on the committee. And uh, this week is International Pollinator Week. So, as you know, I think we are one of the the uh, earliest uh, communities in the in the country to uh, become a bee city. Uh, they've done a great job of uh, highlighting bees and their contributions to our uh, habitat and to our uh, uh, flowers and food growth and, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, Brandon is often called Bee Town. We really are the Bee Town. And so some of the activities that will be going on for International Pollinator Week can be found on uh, Bee City Brandon's website, which is just Bee City, B-E-E, City Brandon.com. Or they also have a Facebook uh uh, page, uh, Twitter handle, and an uh, Instagram handle, also uh, uh, under the handle of B City Brandon. So if you want to check out their uh, activities and other resources, uh, uh, please do. But they make a great contribution to our uh, community by uh, promoting bees, and I was uh, happy to uh, receive the the uh, the banner. And they also, I don't know if it'll show up. There's a little uh, fuzzy little bee that. Uh, stuck to my lapel, so I'm really uh, getting to support that today. Um, any other announcements uh, now that you've had a minute to think? Councillor Fawcett, go ahead. There we go. Yes, thank you, through Your Worship. Just uh, we're trying to get notice out to, to uh, people in Hamilton Heights um, do it the last rainfall um, there, there's a we've moved up a little uh, closer to emergency <laughs> in fixing Braycrest Drive uh, west of 18th Street. So a uh, notice was sent out. Uh, They're going to start doing some construction on uh, on the emergency access uh, as early as tomorrow and possibly by next week. Uh, people in the Hamilton Knights area. We'll, we'll be traveling through that for up to four days as Braycrest is dug up to uh, replace the culvert. So uh, with the notices that went out in that area, uh, there is a, a little uh, code that you can sign up for uh, text messaging, uh, and, you know, through the city as to how changes are taking place. But we'll keep everybody as informed as we can uh, over the next week. 
Um, it is just temporary, uh, but nonetheless, it will be noticeable as it is their only current access. Well, thanks for uh, highlighting that because that is an important one. Certainly, thank you. Any other announcements? Oh, Councillor Cameron, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. And I think uh, Councillor Lupke was in there as well, uh, had popped up. Uh, through Your Worship, just a quick announcement. Uh, as of today at 4 o'clock that the spray parks are open in the city of Brandon, being Kin Spray Park, Stanley Spray Park, Valley View Spray Park, and Westridge Spray, Spray Park. Um, and residents can find out on, more information on the city of Brandon's website at brandon.ca backslash summer dash recreation. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. So I can't see Councillor Lupke on my screen. My uh, view seemed to have gotten frozen in another fashion. So if you've got an announcement, go ahead, Councillor Lupke. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a couple of reminders for uh, for our residents. Uh, first, a reminder to our nonprofit organizations that the deadline for applying for our municipal grant funding for the 2022 budget year is coming up on June the 30th. Uh, there is an online application form through the City of Brandon website, and if you're unable to apply online, you can contact the Grants Review Secretary at City Hall, 204-729-2296 is the number. So just wanted to remind uh, people of that. And the second reminder is to do with our 2021 federal census. Uh, still time to be counted. Uh, the report from the Census Bureau is that about 85% of Brandonites have completed their census. So now the work is starting to get the remaining 15% counted prior to July 30th. And, uh, you know, some citizens face barriers such as language, homelessness, health issues, and those type of things that make it difficult to get the forms completed. And so field workers will be out locating the dwellings that were missed and request people's cooperation to ensure that everyone is counted. And of course, that information is uh, used by uh, many people, including ourselves, uh, the city of Brandon, governments, businesses, associations, community organizations, and others to make important decisions that impact our community moving forward. Uh, Statistics Canada is committing to conducting the census in the safest way possible, allowing all local public health protocols, including the wearing of masks and physical distancing, if you're uncomfortable about an enumerator visiting your home, visit www.census.gc.ca to complete your questionnaire online or by phoning 1-855-340-2021. I have the uh, personally short form census to fill out, and I think online it took me about three and a half minutes to complete. So it certainly is a short period of time to uh, help collect important information. Thank you very much, Councillor Lukey. Uh, good announcements there. Um, I hope you guys can still see me and hear me. My uh, own screen is kind of having some issues here, but uh, hopefully we'll just carry on. Any other announcements that anybody had? I believe Councillor Parker has his hand up. Okay. Yeah, see, I'm not seeing any of the hands up either, so I might need a bit of help. So go ahead, Councillor Parker. No worries. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. I just uh, would let people know that uh, I had the opportunity to welcome Rick Fall uh, and his wife Colette into the city of Brandon on behalf of yourself and council last Wednesday. And uh, very, very nice people. Uh, 60 year old gentleman running the equivalent of a marathon a day uh, to raise funds for uh, child care, cancer, and dreams. Uh, well, James Chess Local One, uh, Make a Wish Foundation, so both worthy causes. And you can look at, uh, up their information at uh, follow Rick, F A L L O Rick dot com if uh, you're interested in donating and helping the cause. I think Rick may have dropped off. I'm coming back. Uh, OK. 
Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm back. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry about that. Technology is all wonderful when it works, but it just kicked me out of the meeting. I had to come back in again. So sorry about that, Councillor Parker. And okay. although it did kind of fix my screen up, so that was worthwhile. Any other announcements then that I might have missed seeing hands up? Okay, I think we got that covered. Thanks, everyone. So we can move on to the next item, please. Under the order of general business, Your Worship, we have a request for funding assistance from Manitoba Water Services Board for the city's water reclamation facility maintenance building. Very good. Uh, Very good. Before we get into that, I'm not sure if somebody was prepared to make a presentation to us first. I think I saw this Stangerlin uh, coming forward, so go ahead if you were planning to. Thank you. Good evening, uh, your worship and council. At the beginning of every year, the city submits a detailed list of water and wastewater projects to the Manitoba Water Services Board for funding consideration. Recently, the city has been quite successful obtaining approval from the board with three uh, water and wastewater projects currently underway with their assistance. Uh, earlier this month, uh, the city was notified that we qualified for additional project funding with the board for financial and from a financial and technical perspective, given the dollar value and multidisciplined aspects of the new maintenance shop in the city's 2021 capital budget, as well as the funding model, this project was proposed for assistance. With a resolution from council, this project can proceed with the board starting this year. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh and we will open the floor for questions and after that then we'll uh, take a motion but we'll get the questions out of the way first and again i'm not i hope you're not seeing any hands up so forgive me if you have your hand up my system's had a little bit of fun tonight but uh I think it's quite straightforward between that and the uh, report that you had provided, uh, Alexia. So I think we're pretty much covered off. So just stay on the line in case questions arise once we get a motion on the table. So I'd like to have a motion come forward. Who'd like to handle that, please? Councillor Cameron, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the City of Brandon apply to the Manitoba Water Services Board for technical and financial assistance with respect to the Water Reclamation Facility Maintenance Building. Thank you. Seconder, please. Councillor Cullen, over wish to speak. Uh, no, thank you, Your Worship. I think Ms. Stangerlen uh, covered it quite well. Thank you. Um, I'll be a little indelicate for the members of the public that uh, water reclamation facility just may not be in everyone's uh, nomenclature. So it is the sewage treatment plant, if I'm uh, not mistaken, uh, Alexia. And uh, but of course, they have such a sophisticated system out there of uh, taking the effluent and turning it back into crystal clear water. It is now called a water reclamation uh, facility, and I have seen it, and the water that when they're done with it and it goes back in the river is crystal clear, certainly far better than the water we get out of the river, so we're certainly doing our part uh, to uh, protect the environment. So I hope you didn't mind, Alexia, that I explained what a water reclamation facility uh, is to those that are maybe not quite as enlightened yet. So, uh, Any other uh, questions uh, or comments before we ask for the question on the motion? Not seeing any. I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much and thank you uh, Ms. Stangerland for uh, 
um, all the work that you really uh, do. I know you've got a lot on your plate between our water treatment plant and the water reclamation facility. The utilities are certainly a very big part, uh, a very, uh, I always call it a mission critical thing that the city does. So thanks for your leadership in that area. And next item, please, Madam Clerk. Is the consideration of affordable housing incentives for the property at 415 25th Street. Thank you. I think we probably would be hearing from uh, Mrs. Trudell on this. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Uh, all right. So I think, you know, typically I keep my overviews fairly succinct, but I think um, given the longevity of this project, I'm going to put a bit of background into tonight's presentation before we uh, get to the end of it. So um, I beg your indulgence as we move through it. So in July of, 2020, of 2010, the City of Brandon released a request for proposals for the development of the Fleming property, which included the lands now known as 415 25th Street. Development of the site was awarded to 3784500 Manitoba Littid based on a proposal to develop commercial buildings that fronted on Victoria Avenue and contingent upon the developer donating the back parcel of land that we now know as 415 25th Street for the purpose of affordable housing. So since that project was awarded, um, the commercial side of it has been fully developed and is fully occupied. The lands on the northern portion, which was to be affordable housing, remains vacant today. So the property owners struck an agreement with Brandon University to develop affordable housing on the rear portion of the site. Um, and they worked forward um, trying to develop both a project that was suitable for the neighborhood as well as to secure funding. Um, they had made great strides, but unfortunately, um, with some changing in government funding models in 2016, that project's funding was placed on hold. So with Brandon University unable to proceed with the proposed affordable housing project, the property owner has agreed to take on the responsibility of developing an our affordable housing project on the site, provided it's economically viable to do so. So the approximately $11 million project um, that is being proposed this evening for uh, Council's consideration consists of uh, 48 units. So there would be 42 two-bedroom units and six three-bedroom units. All of those units will meet government standards for accessibility and they will be locked into affordable rents for 20 years. Um, after the 20 year funding agreement that the proponent would have with the city, then the rents would be protected through rent controls. So based on the current guidelines, the maximum rent for a two bedroom would be $969 and that would include essential utilities. Um, the rent for the three bedrooms would be 1124 and again include essential utilities. Uh, in order to access the affordable units, if they proceed, uh, individuals occupying them would have to meet the maximum income thresholds. So for a family without children, that maximum income is $56,694. And for a household that has children, it's $75,592. And those uh, affordable rents are set by the province of Manitoba, and they are the ones that we typically align our affordable housing projects with. Uh, a development, uh, a developer requirement, um, should this go ahead, would be for them to verify incomes annually with their tenants for the duration of the contract. And that just ensures that the individuals that are occupying the units are the individuals that meet the, the maximum thresholds. So should this evening's recommendation be approved, um, the site will be the fifth and final parcel of land that has been cooperative, cooperatively developed between Manitoba Housing Renewal Corporation and the city under an existing affordable housing partnership. Um, a $1,560,000 grant 
coming specifically from Manitoba Housing, has been uh, notionally approved for 24 of the 48 units. It just needs to go through uh, the normal due diligence and processes that all of those funding arrangements would. In March of 2021, the City of Brandon entered into a funding agreement with Manitoba Housing and Renewal Corporation, whereby they advanced us uh, capital funding in the amount of approximately $4.1 million in order for the City to use those funds to leverage the development or redevelopment of affordable housing in the City. So it's staff's recommendation that $1,560,000 be allocated from those funds received from Manitoba Housing Renewal Corporation uh, and be used to fund the second 24 units that are proposed at 415 25th Street. So despite uh, significant increases in construction costs as a result of the COVID pandemic, um, government assistance for this project is in keeping with previous incentives approved for many prior projects that have occurred not only in the city of Brandon, but elsewhere in the province as well. Um, the assistance requested for this project consists of capital funding that equals $65,000 per door for each of the 24 units that are not being funded by another level of government. Um, it includes a tax offsetting grant equal to 50% of the municipal funding for 20 years. And again, this would be in keeping with the uh, normal project. Oh, my apologies. I just realized I didn't have my camera on. <laughs> and then the last component of the uh, request is the donation of the land back to the property developer so that he can utilize it for affordable housing in the same way that Brandon University would have done so should they have been able to take the project forward. So the appropriate funding agreements obviously would be uh, entered into to, to protect the city's interests and in keeping with our normal practices we advance grants um, based on completed milestones, so the risk side of it to the city is very minimal in nature. So should this evening's funding request be approved, um, construction is projected to commence in early 2022 and be ready to have the tenants move in in spring of 2023. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that Council might have. Thank you very much for a very thorough report, Mr. Trudell. So we'll open up the question, uh, floor for questions from Council. <clears throat> Councilor Cameron. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you through you to Ms. Trudell. Um, one of the things that, you know, obviously this, this project has been on the radar for the residents of that area, uh, being in my ward for a number of years. Um, one of the questions that I know will come up and, and will be something that's incredibly important to them is parking. Um, you know, obviously with the two pro properties that are developed right on Victoria Avenue, a lot of the overflow parking actually falls back onto 25th Street in the 400 block. So, um, can you give some sort of assurance, uh, you know, by way of the agreement with the, uh, developer? that property or that parking will be housed internal to the development um, and that it won't become street level parking where, you know, people are challenged with the, the employees that are working there already. And then if there was further street level parking, it would be a real, real challenge for them. Great question. So through you, your worship to Councillor Cameron, um, obviously the developer for himself, um, being the owner of those uh, commercial properties, is well aware of the parking constraints in the area. Uh, part of his original agreement with Brandon University when they were going to be proceeding with the project was to not only have sufficient parking for the affordable housing component, but also to um, provide approximately 20 parking stalls for the commercial project. So that was going to be part and parcel of the design where you would see an integrated parking plan that would give the extra parking for the commercial as well as adequately meet the needs of the residential units. And the developer is um, very eager and committed to keeping that same principle in this project. 
Thank you very much for that. That's a good question, Councillor Cameron. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions of uh, Mr. Trudell? Not seeing any other hands coming up. As always, a very thorough report, so it's probably covered most of it off, along with the report that we did have attached to the agenda. So I think we're probably uh, ready to put the matter on the floor. Councillor Cameron, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, I move that the affordable housing incentive be approved for 3784500 Manitoba Limited to facilitate the development of a 48 of 48 affordable housing units at 415 25th Street, whereby the incentive shall be comprised of one a capital grant in the amount of one million five hundred and sixty thousand dollars with said funds to be transferred from the Manitoba Housing and Renewal Corporation grant held by the City of Brandon as per the March 24th, 2021 funding agreement. Two, a 20-year tax offsetting grant equal to 50% of the municipal taxes payable, whereby year one of the tax set offsetting grant will be uh, the year in which the new structure at 415 25th Street is added to the City of Brandon tax roll. And three, the sale of 415 25th Street for $1. Uh, and then through your worship, uh, just proceed with and further the admin yes. that admin administration be authorized to execute the associated agreements required to protect the city's interests in accordance with any procedures, policies, bylaws, and acts. Very good. Thanks, Councillor Cameron. Seconder, please. Councillor Parker, thank you. Whoever wish to speak. Uh, just briefly, Your Worship, um, in looking at this, obviously, you know, that the, it has been on the radar for a number of years for the residents there. Uh, I think it fulfills the expectations set forth by uh, Council when awarding the development initially back in, in 2010. Um, as far as the land donation and the tax offsetting grant, uh, the recommendations are also keeping with Council's past approvals. So I think there's a level of comfort in, in what's being proposed here. And uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in improving that from being a, an underkept property to uh, another area that becomes a vibrant part of that neighbourhood. Well said. Any other uh, discussion, questions, comments? Councillor Shaboye, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, through to the presenter, I, I guess to Ms. Trudeau. Uh, one thing I, I noticed on um, the motion, uh, there's no mention about um, keeping the rates, the rental rates affordable for 20 years. Is that going to be written into the agreement? Through you, Your Worship. Yes, that is a standard part and parcel of all of our funding agreements. So everything is contingent upon the agreement of the 20 years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments before we uh, get to calling for the question? Not seeing, I will say that, uh, you know, this is a significant uh, development of 48 affordable housing units. Um, you know, we, we certainly dearly know that uh, we need more and more. Our city is growing and um, these, you know, new 48 uh, affordable units will be well appreciated uh, by, by many people. So this will, uh, and uh, you know, a good part of the uh, community is kind of an infill uh, development, if you will. So I think this is certainly going to be a a, a great additional development and uh, great to see it finally moving forward. Uh, I know there was reasons for the slowdown, but uh, we can uh, get it going now. So uh, if there are not any other comments, I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Next item, please. It's the Pacific Avenue Conceptual Design and Streetscape Strategy. Thank you. And we probably have a presentation on this, or we'll, we'll just see if um, administration are coming forward first, Councillor Desjardins, and then we'll have you make the motion. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Van Heusen. I'm the uh, traffic and transportation planner for the city of Brandon in the engineering department. And uh, tonight, 
Uh, it's my privilege to uh, present to you the Pacific Avenue Streetscape Strategy uh, report. Um, I'll have a brief presentation and a time for questions in the public realm. I'm just trying to uh, make sure that uh, I have everything so I can share my screen here. No. Come on. All right. Uh, just want to get a verification. Everybody can see my screen. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So uh, uh, tonight. Oh. Sorry about that. I'll just get my notes here. <laughs> um, yeah, so tonight, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be uh, discussing here the uh, report with the uh, with the project that the engineering uh, planning uh, departments have been doing in collaboration with our hired consultant, uh, Urban Systems, the, uh, the reimagine a complete street uh, design options for uh, Pacific Avenue. Uh, that's uh, the portion of Pacific Avenue between 1st and 18th Street uh, as it goes through the downtown. So we've been working on this one for quite a while, starting way back in July of uh, last year with the project initiation and uh, well into April and May with the finalizing of recommendations in the report. Uh, the graphic before you kind of shows an overview of the timeline for this project. And tonight I will highlight a little bit uh, about what we have done and uh, please present a recommendation for the plan uh, and describe the process therein. So uh, here we can see the study area for the project being uh, Pacific Avenue between 1st Street and 18th Street. Okay, and the community stakeholder engagement uh, was a very important part of this project uh, as we deal with the effects of COVID-19, the restrictions and to, to traditional public engagement as a result. Uh, we look uh, to be creative in how that we engage. Uh, so, for example, one of the big things that we did was a, a pop-up bike lane on Pacific Avenue, uh, allowing the users to experience at a basic level what the converted street would look like uh, if it incorporated on-street bike lanes. We also used virtual webinars, online mapping tools, and surveys. So, through the, uh, through the engagement that we had initially, uh, we heard three clear values defined. Uh, connections, uh, con sorry, connected, uh, connections for all uh, transportation modes, providing uh, for a variety of different uses. Uh, safety, of course, improvements to road safety, community safety of all road types, use, road user types. Uh, and activity, uh, a connection within the streetscape for all the different types of uses through and in the downtown. And from these, uh, the initial collaboration came three options. I'll kind of briefly describe them through before we get to our recommendation. Uh, equipped with the feedback from targeted stakeholders, the design team came up with those three options. Option one before you was a uh, bi-directional bikeway that saw parking lanes on the north side of Pacific Avenue separated by delineators. Uh, this option is similar to what uh, we saw last summer with the pop-up bike lane. Option two was a, a multi-use trail on the north side of Pacific Avenue. Uh, this option preserved the on-street parking, but combined the cycle and pedestrian traffic and reduced the amount of walkable space exclusive for pedestrians through the corridor. And option three was a unidirectional bikeway on both sides of the street. Again, a parking lane is eliminated on the north side in favor of cycle traffic and separated sidewalks. To uh, aid in the evaluation uh, of the various options, the project team came up with a set of criteria uh, to form a technical evaluation and included connectivity, safety, social impact, impact to emergency services, pedestrian comfort, accessibility, cyclist comfort, motor vehicles, impact to transit, streetscape, uh, business access, parking, loading zone impacts, implementation, street maintenance costs, utilities, and public feedback. So during the previous round of engagement, or the first round, the uh, public and stakeholders were offered uh, the opportunity to rank uh, their most, their five most important uh, pieces of the criteria, as well as administration and our consultant 
uh, rank them based on a on a scale from very good to poor. So the ratings were summed up in each option. Overall comparison came forward. Uh, the overall rank of the technical evaluation uh, resulted in option one being the best uh, most preferred option, uh, option three, and then option two being the third best. Each option has their own qualities that makes them better and results for uh, for the best options came down within the aggregate number of high scoring ranks receiving the highest uh, performance. Uh, the public, when they provided their comments, uh, preferred option two uh, being the most preferred uh, closely by option one. And we took that forward too by weighting uh, the rankings as well and showing uh, what was a, a first choice and a second choice and a third choice. And our weighted rank that you'll see on the right there showed that option two uh, came out with the, as the most popular, uh, with followed by closely behind by option one and then option three. So uh, moving forward, uh, administration and our consultant uh, opted to, um, uh, based on the technical evaluation and the online uh, consultation, uh, go with a, uh, a hybrid of a, rec a recommended design. That would include uh, some of the positives uh, of feedback that we heard from our technical analysis, as well as the public consultation from both option one and option two uh, into the preferred design, which I'll kind of highlight through. Uh, next, so uh, the maps and graphics that we'll see uh, are kind of moving from uh, east to west as we go from First Street along Pacific Avenue through to the 18th Street, uh, and it'll show at a conceptual level uh, what the uh, what administration is proposing for for what the uh, design and renewal for Pacific Avenue uh, could look like. And so we'll start with uh, here at 2nd Street as we see the newly designed multi-use trail that comes off the new 1st Street Bridge. Uh, go into that multi-use pathway that was uh, the highlight of option two uh, that I had highlighted out. Uh, we see on-street parking preserved. And uh, skipping over a couple of blocks, uh, we see the same, uh, same cross-section and plan view of the multi-use trail. Uh, up until about 5th Street, and then it transitions into that option one style uh, bi-directional bikeway uh, that we saw from option one. Uh, existing driveway accesses are maintained, and we sign them accordingly uh, and with uh, with both uh, street signs for, for cycle traffic, pedestrians, road traffic, uh, as well as line paint that is, uh, that is specially designed to give attention to drivers and, and cyclists for, um, for conflict points. Uh, moving further to the west, uh, here we see 6th and 7th Street. Uh, the bulb, we see bulb outs present at all intersections, uh, especially where there are crosswalks, uh, or co uh, conflicts with uh, pedestrians crossing. Uh, this gives ample space for pedestrian visibility and shorter crossing distances for accessibility. Uh, and they provide preserve safety for both uh, motorists and pedestrians. Moving further west, uh, we see the 8th Street bus mall there on the right. Uh, the, we have we have full stop control maintained at the 8th Street Bus Mall and uh, left turn points for crossing cycle traffic uh, from bike lanes are painted through the intersection, of course, to ensure uh, additional awareness for drivers who with a potential conflict. Uh, moving further west here, we see uh, 10th and 11th Street. Uh, the design recognizes the existing crosswalk improvements or sorry, not crosswalk, sidewalk improvements that the city had made uh, very recently along the north side of Pacific Avenue. And so here we see uh, more of that hybrid design where the sidewalk is not necessarily separated by a boulevard between the cycle traffic, uh, but is uh, is that existing sidewalk and curb uh, so as to um, in, in, um, keep the costs uh, down with, uh, with its replacement. Um, uh, another note to mention here along this uh, preferred option, is that the curb curbing on the north side of Pacific Avenue is maintained throughout the entirety of the uh, recommendation. So no major improvements or, or digging up of infrastructure we've already put in uh, would be required. Uh, just some more notes as we move towards 13th Street here. Uh, a three and a half meter lane design was chosen for travel lanes on Pacific Avenue to ensure that the vehicles traveling on this collector style street can do so comfortably, but also cautiously, so as to be alerted of the increased presence of cyclists, pedestrians, and other multimodal devices. 
The parking lane design width is uh, 2.6 meters, which matches our off-street parking standard for a parking stall. And continuing along as we approach uh, 15th Street, uh, the quarter approaches that westerly intersection of 18th Street. The bikeway transitions back into a multi-use trail uh, to connect with the planned improvements at the daily overpass. And finally, here we see the conceptual design with the functional design of the 18th Street overpass. Uh, you'll notice, too, the, uh, the potential for a gateway feature in that blue star there in some of the open land space uh, from the uh, daily overpass project. Uh, there'll be an option, too, within the streetscape strategy that recommended uh, certain stylings of uh, gateway features uh, that we could look at here, welcoming uh, residents and visitors to our downtown. Some of the streetscape design elements examples are, are seen on screen here. Uh, of course, our consultants looked at uh, a variety of different things, landscaping features, signage, text, uh, different styles of benches and brickwork. Um, yeah, but while trying to preserve the, the heritage aspect uh, and, uh, and roots that our city comes from. So moving into uh, our cost estimates, um, the city or the project included a class B uh, cost estimate. And so we see for about 1400 meters of Pacific Avenue stretching from 1st to 18th, the upgrades would total a little over six million dollars. Uh, this number seems a little bit high, so I'll try to break it down a little bit further so that it, it feels a little bit more manageable. Um, the civic wor civil works uh, are the bulk co of the costs, and we see the most benefit for this project. Uh, this cost should be done with the drainage improvement allowance, as, as you see there is a separate line, uh, as it covers the relocation of catch basins as necessary and serve better to be done with these types of works. Uh, design and contingency could further be refined if we were to do that in-house uh, as a part of our capital design. Uh, landscaping features can be incorporated into our parks department budgets uh, and may include uh, maybe less than anticipated, uh, especially if they were to use existing uh, programs that they have, such as the uh, planter box that we see throughout the city. Uh, and each of the blocks were costed out individually so that the city could use a block by block approach for upgrades based on the development timings along the corridor. So as opposed to just, you know, uh, seeing this large cost and having to do it all at once is something that we could definitely implement uh, incrementally, especially as development is uh, fostered along these blocks. And this uh, this final slide here shows uh, kind of a uh, the cost estimates with regards to the bikes bicycle lane improvement. Uh, this is one of the things that we would likely want to do uh, for first uh, as it kind of forms that baseline along the corridor and then moving towards those incremental costs on a block by block basis to improve the uh, improve the the, uh, the curbing and landscaping within the uh, corridor. Um, again, this is a uh, this is a uh, a cost that's a little bit more manageable uh, and upfront uh, to kind of make that transition over to uh, uh, to this bicycle lane improvements. So that kind of brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, again, uh, there's a quite a large report that has been distributed to council and is available on the city website for reading. And at this time, uh, we will take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Heusen. Um very fulsome report. Of course, we've had uh, discussions as a council with uh, you and your team on this, but uh, certainly now making this presentation uh, visible to the public has uh, certainly been a, a good exercise. So I'm going to open it up. First, I have Councillor Parker. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Worship Speed. It's Sam. I'm just wondering, Sam, can you let the folks know who uh, may be watching? What kind of timelines we're looking at? What What's the best case scenario to have the project A started and B completed, provided that funding is uh, available as needed? Uh, through your worship to the councillor, uh, really, you kind of answered it myself. It's really going to be dependent upon when when funding is available. I mean, we could start this as early as next year. Uh, but again, uh, as I highlighted in my report, uh, we, we really want to time most of the improvements along with um, with the development that we would anticipate along Pacific Avenue uh, in there. Certainly, we've identified that uh, improving and in installing the uh, the aspects of the bike lane as it times and, and balances up with the 
project that we're seeing at the daily overpass is one of our goals that we have uh, as to whether uh, as to when specifically that would happen. Um, it really would depends on on uh, on on how this project fits in with all of the other capital costs that we uh, that we see throughout the city of Brandon. Thank you. Very good. I have Councillor Shaboye, then Councillor Dejarly. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through to um, to Mr. Van Hoosen. Uh, thanks, Sam, for all your work on this file because I know it's it, it's been a long process, and and you recognize the importance of this corridor uh, for all the citizens of the city. The question I have is is um, of course uh, we only have a few. You know, viewers that are watching tonight and, and and the screens are small. Are you going to present um, these drawings in some type of a public format? I know it's difficult with COVID, but uh, I just want to know if the public are going to have an opportunity uh, to further see these plans and and if there is further consultation involved. Uh, through your worship to the councillor, uh, we did have a public engagement session in I believe April. Or, or May, the, the final round of public engagement where we had uh, our final virtual event, which was a, uh, a YouTube video presentation uh, that was a very similar presentation to uh, to what you saw here tonight. Uh, it was a little bit more detailed, uh, showing uh, a kind of a video again of all of the different uh, aspects of the preferred option. Uh, so certainly residents who are watching this after the fact can definitely go watch that YouTube video. Uh, and like I said in the last slide, the report is on our website and all of the pictures and diagrams are in a, a really nice colorized PDF high resolution uh, for uh, anyone who wants to preview them there. Uh, they can definitely reach out to the clerk's office if they need assistance with that, but it's definitely up on our website and uh, able to be viewed. And again, we're always collecting feedback and data, uh, so feel free to reach out to the engineering department, uh, ask about Pacific Avenue, and all calls and emails will find their way to my desk. Okay, thanks for that, Sam. And, and I think probably you will get a call from the Age Friendly Committee of Council uh, because I know that they were, you know, uh, wanted to take a look at the plans and ensure that accessibility was considered not only you know from a bicycle perspective but from most importantly from a pedestrian pedestrian perspective on this uh, development yeah absolutely and uh, again we can either sit down one-on-one -on -one. i will uh, i will note out that when i say the words uh, multimodal uh that that kind of encompasses all all different types of non-vehicle road users so that means we take a look at pedestrians and cyclists but also those who would use a mobility device a scooter uh, an e-bike uh, a walker a wheelchair any sort of device that helps them walk and navigate through the city and of course all of the different recommendations that we have for our crosswalks and ball boats uh, take all of those uh, considerations for uh, making our city more walkable for all the different types of road users, no matter if they're, you know, just learning to walk or uh, or or well into their prime years uh, and still walking strong. Okay, thanks for that, Sam. I think it'll be a beautiful corridor at some point. Sure. Thank you, and Councillor Dejarly was next. Thank you, through your worship, Sam. Horse and buggy too, multimodal horse and buggy. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great list. That was impressive. You came out with them. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm looking forward to to the development. Uh, I've learned uh, on council that uh, I'm frozen. Is everybody's frozen? You are frozen, but we can hear you. You can hear me. Okay, yeah. I'll keep talking. Although I've learned from council, from being in my time of council, that often the decisions that we we make around um, multi, uh, uh, sorry, uh, master plans and infrastructure. Uh, we often don't um, we often don't see there. It's set up for future generations and for future councils to uh, bear witness to. So uh, I know that uh, um, you, you mentioned it depends on funding, um, but I'm thinking about some of the stuff that we've already got uh, uh, at work. On Pacific, and wondering if we could attach some timelines to that. And I guess I'm speaking more specifically to, you know, a sidewalk to nowhere right now along the uh, north side of Pacific, um, in between I think it's uh, 12th and 16th, and uh, and then the gateway, uh, uh, the gateway component. I'm wondering uh, if you think we could move on that sooner rather than later. 
uh, through your worship to the counselor. Uh, for sure, this uh, this project that we've been dealing with definitely paints a picture forward for our infrastructure department uh, to uh, to use in their designs as as uh, as the um, expected upgrades to our sidewalk infrastructure come forward. Uh, so as you mentioned, the sidewalk to nowhere on the north side of Pacific a Avenue. Um, definitely these uh, portions would either come out uh, out of that program or we would rectify them through the anticipated development on those properties. And of course, with this plan in place now, we have uh, a clear road vision for how those sidewalks can be developed. Uh, they have to be in compliance with this plan. And uh, of course, the, the downtown secondary plan too. Uh, and then of course, as they're looking at uh, things like um, street furniture and uh, accommodations for patios within the right of way and such, we have the, this plan that kind of allocates that and fits it all together so that we anticipate these uh, various uses that are that are being proposed in our downtown instead of trying to fit them in to an existing uh, road network um, while trying to balance all the different uh, uses. In terms of the gateway, uh, again, I'll echo what I had mentioned to Councillor Parker. It really comes forward as to uh, uh, as to whether or not this wants to be. We have a kind of our direction forward, and uh, as administration, we can definitely put those proposals through and. Uh, as we see them, uh, those decisions be made uh, in balancing all the other projects within the city, uh, we can definitely make sure that we um, we highlight these ones. Uh, I'll just on a side note too, uh, our department is also working on how we can incorporate these studies um, and, and fund them uh, either through the various channels that we have through our capital plan, through development cost charges, or other uh, other boundary improvements, and that's something that hopefully we can bring forward at a future date. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that got Councillor Dejarly covered off. Uh, I don't see any other hands up at the moment. Okay, great conversation. Again, great presentation there, Sam. So. I think we're probably ready to put the matter on the floor. I think Councillor DeJarley was prepared to do that as it's in his ward. So go ahead if you would. We might have lost them all together though. That happened to me when I froze and then I was gone. If somebody else wouldn't mind making that motion for Councillor DeJarley, please. Councillor Cameron, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I move that the Pacific Avenue conceptual design and streetscape strategy be received. And I think Councillor Lupke was prepared to second that. I'm mistaken, I'm putting him down. So, any discussion? I'm sorry we lost the ward councillor, but I think he got his information in there before. Uh, okay, Councillor Parker, I think, has his hand up. Oh, hand down. I think he was getting ready to vote. I think we are ready for the question on this very important project, uh, long range uh, thinking, which is really good to see, and we can uh, work our way at it uh, over the years. So, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Next item, please. This is the application to subdivide 1230 18th Street North. Um, very good. Uh, Councillor Fawcett, do you want to take this or are we having a presentation from staff first? Uh, Ryan, uh, your worship, Ryan is no longer with us. He was had asked me to step in in his place, so I will do my best. All I will say is, is we've gone through the public hearing with this. It's gone through second reading in council. Uh, the development agreement has been signed by both parties, allowing us to bring the application to subdivide and to rezone the properties in front of council tonight. Very good. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Pulak. Um, probably putting a motion on the floor would be in order. Do you want to take that, Councillor Fawcett? Yes, thank you, uh, through your worship. Uh, that the application to subdivide, tw subdivide 1230 18th Street North to create three bare land condominium units and widen a street right of way in the residential single detached and open space zone be approved. Subject to the owner or successor successfully rezoning the subject property 
from residential large lot to residential single detached and open space zones. Thank you. Seconder, please. Councillor Parker, move wish to speak. Yes, thank you, through your worship. Uh, I'm going to reiterate more or less what uh, Councillor Council Pulak, or he, he wishes, but, uh, but what Mr. Pulak had just mentioned, uh, that we have discussed this quite thoroughly now. Uh, they have gone to the point where they now have signed their agreement, and this is the final uh, piece. We've had the two public hearings uh, and lots of information on this. So. Thanks for that. We will be dealing with the rezoning as well a little later on the agenda. So any uh, questions or comments that other members of council might have before we call the question? Not seeing any, I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. Is the utility rate rider for the water treatment plant upgrade to venture servicing costs? There you go. I think we have uh, this is Rochelle on um, to speak to this, but I'm not sure if she was, she was just going to be answering questions or if she had a, some highlights to provide us. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. Um, yes, I do have a few highlights to uh, share with you. Um, I'm going to take you back a, a few years. Um, the Water Utility Master Plan was uh, developed in 2012. Uh, in the plan, the chemical storage and chemical handling were identified as the most critical area of improvement or for improvement as it pertained to public safety and national drinking water standards. A public information session was held on February 4th, uh, 2019, with administration available to answer any questions regarding the chemical building project or the proposed borrowing. Subsequent to the public information session, the sequence of events um, that has brought us to this point today are sum summarized on the list uh, displayed on your screens. These include the passing of bylaw number 7229 for the authorization of borrowing up to $16 million for the project. The process for the borrowing included obtaining approval from the Municipal Board and the Public Utilities Board. An application was submitted to the Public Utilities Board um, in June of 2019 requesting approval to implement a per cubic meter surcharge over a term of 20 years or over the term of 20 years of the borrowing as the source of funding for the debenture servicing costs, which would be both principal and interest. In May of 2021, Series A of the borrowing was issued for $8 million. A resolution of Council tonight is the last requirement to be submitted to the PUB for final approval, approval prior to billing the surcharge to utility customers. This surcharge will provide the funding source for the debenture servicing costs over the term of 20 years. Based on the proposed surcharge, a typical household with four people consuming 46 cubic meters of water per quarter would see a charge of approximately $4.14 per quarter added to their utility bill. Over the 20-year term of the debenture, this would equal $331.20. Once the final PUB approval is received, administration will begin notifying utility customers by including an information insert with all utility bills. As the city is divided into three billing cycles, this will take three months to complete the process. That's everything. Thank you very much. And again, we'll open the floor for questions before we get around to uh, putting the motion on the floor. So any questions of uh, Ms. Rochelle? And it's fairly straightforward. Your report was quite uh, thorough. So I think that's covered. Thank you very much, Val. So a motion uh, for the matter would be in order, please. Councillor Lukey, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. 
I move that administrative administration execute the public utilities board orderage principle number BO 100-19 regarding the city of Brandon's proposal to recover the debenture servicing costs for the water treatment plant upgrade in the Brandon water and wastewater utility through a utility rate rider. Thank you. Seconder, please. Councilor Cullen. Move wish to speak. No, your worship. I think we've covered it off between the presentation and, uh, and the information that was uh, given previously. Thank you. Uh, any discussion, questions? Again, uh, quite straightforward. So I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? And is carried. And again, uh, provision of clean, reliable drinking water, one of the most important things we do. So this is a very important uh, topic. Next item, please, Madam Clerk. Under the order of bylaws, your worship bylaw number 7270, which is the rezoning of property at 1230 18th Street North. Councilor Fawcett. Thank you, through your worship, uh, to rezone property located at 1230 18th Street North from residential large lot zone to residential single detached and open space zone. Oh, that, no, oh let me read the rest of this. <laughs> Heather just read that. The bylaw number 7270 to rezone property located at 1230 18th Street North uh, from residential large lot zone to residential single detached and open space zones be read a third and final time. Two seconder, please. Councillor Shiboye, Hoover wish to speak? Yes, uh, thank you through your worship. This is just uh, uh, the final piece on that uh, uh, application to subdivide that we had there earlier and uh, third and final reading on it. So we have debated it fairly thoroughly. We have. Any other discussion? Not seeing any, I'm going to call for the question, but third reading uh, requires a recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? It is carried unanimously. Thank you. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7297, which is to repeal the inactive reserve bylaws. We'd like to tackle this one. It's an interesting one. Councillor Barry. <coughs> Pardon me. Yes. Thank you, Worship. Um, I move that bylaw number 7297 to repeal an act of reserve bylaws be read a second time. Seconder, please. Councillor Shaboye. Move to speak. Uh, I don't, but if anybody from administration needs to add some information to that, uh, please welcome them to do so. Very good. Uh, Maybe the uh, city clerk might just give us a bit of an overview on this. I can, Your Worship, through to councillors, through Your Worship. Um, during recent budget deliberations, uh, we had council had cause to uh, close one of the reserve bylaw or reserve funds that we had created that had been created, and so we decided we needed to do a review of all the existing reserve funds because many of them as you'll notice from the list have become uh, redundant and no longer serve their purpose and have a zero balance in them so in consultation with uh, the provincial government it was determined that it would be best to repeal those inactive bylaws and get them off the books and so that is what this bylaw does it's kind of an omnibus to bylaw to tackle all the existing uh, reserve bylaws that we identified that are no longer active and have a zero balance. And I will say moving forward, there a review of these will be built into our administrative review of bylaws, so we won't be hopefully bringing forward bylaws that were created in 1950s and 60s for you to repeal. In the future, they will be done on a much more timely basis. Very good. The general house cleaning. Um, right. My wife will be shocked that I'm part of this because I save everything and save files and so on and so forth. But to give the general public a, uh, a little uh, taste of what's on the list, uh, there's uh, uh, there was one to create a reserve fund for the 1967 centennial celebrations, uh, similar one for the 1970 Manitoba centennial celebrations, 
one for the 1982 Brandon Centennial celebrations. I had to create a reserve for the 1979 Jew Canada Summer Ga or Winter Games. So uh, that just gives you kind of an idea that uh, these can easily be uh, cleaned up and get off our books. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, mover wish to close. No, thank you, Your Worship. Very good. I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And third reading would be in order. Councillor Barry, if you would. Yes, thank you, Worship. I move that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Seconded by Councillor Shaboy again. I don't imagine there's any further discussion. If not, again, third reading requires a uh, recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Next item, please. And finally, under bylaws, bylaw number 7307, which is an amendment to building bylaw number 7258 regarding fire safety requirements. We'd like to take this one. Councillor Cullen, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. That bylaw number 7307 to amend by uh, building bylaw number 7258 with respect to fire safety requirements be read a first time. Seconder, please. Councillor Lutke. Uh, first reading, not normally uh, debatable, just gets the process started. So we're going to go straight to calling of the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. Giving of notice, Your Worship. Any giving of notice this evening? Seeing none. Next item, then, please. A motion to adjourn would be in order, Your Worship. Moved by Councillor Barry, seconded by Councillor Shaboye. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much, everyone. In uh, puffing it through another virtual meeting, but we uh, get the business done. So thanks for carrying on. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.